dread familiar. The price of knowledge is blood. Jackson Black. This is it. Episode 14, the final episode of season one of The Dread Familiar. Also, part three being the conclusion of The Dreams in the Witch House by H.P. Lovecraft. Thanks so much for listening. Submissions for season two are currently open, so if you want your story read or you'd like to audition to read a story, send them to me, submissions at thedreadfamiliar.com. I'm going to be away for a few months, and I hope to return with some fantastic new stories to wriggle into your spine and the base of your skull. If you haven't heard parts one and two of this story, please go back to episode 12 and start there. I would really appreciate it. And remember, although a pioneer of horror, Lovecraft was a bigot. Don't find dread in the story's superstitious foreigners or in the visage of the eponymous black man. Find fear in the thought of seeing the world through the eyes of a man that views every person unlike himself as a threat. This is the conclusion of The Dreams in the Witch House by H.P. Lovecraft. On the morning of April 27th, a fresh rat hole appeared in the room where Gilman was a guest. But Dombrowski tinned it up during the day. The poison was not having much effect, for scratchings and scurryings in the walls were virtually undiminished. Elwood was out late that night, and Gilman waited up for him. He did not wish to go to sleep in a room alone, especially since he thought he had glimpsed in the evening twilight the repellent old woman whose image had become so horribly transferred to his dreams. He wondered who she was, and what had been near her rattling the tin can in a rubbish heap at the mouth of a squalid courtyard. The crone had seemed to notice him and leer evilly at him, though perhaps this was merely his imagination. The next day both youths felt very tired, and knew they would sleep like dogs when night came. In the evening, they drowsily discussed the mathematical studies which had so completely and perhaps harmfully engrossed Gilman, and speculated about the linkage with ancient magic and folklore which seemed so darkly probable. They spoke of old Keziah Mason, and Elwood agreed that Gilman had good scientific grounds for thinking she might have stumbled on strange and significant information. The hidden cults to which these witches belonged often guarded and handed down surprising secrets from elder, forgotten eons, and it was by no means impossible that Keziah had actually mastered the art of passing through dimensional gates. Tradition emphasizes the uselessness of material barriers in halting a witch's notions. Whether a modern student could ever gain similar powers from mathematical research alone was still to be seen. Success, Gilman added, might lead to dangerous and unthinkable situations, for who could foretell the conditions pervading an adjacent but normally inaccessible dimension? On the other hand, the picturesque possibilities were enormous. Time could not exist in certain belts of space, and by entering and remaining in such a belt, one might preserve one's life and age indefinitely never suffering organic metabolism or deterioration except for slight amounts incurred during visits to one's own or similar planes. One might, for example, pass into a timeless dimension and emerge at some remote period on the Earth's history as young as before. Whether anybody had ever managed to do this, one could hardly conjecture with any degree of authority. Old legends are hazy and ambiguous, and in historic times all attempts at crossing forbidden gaps seem complicated by strange and terrible alliances with beings and messengers from outside. There was the immemorial figure of the deputy, or messenger of hidden and terrible powers, the black man of the witch cult, and the Nyarlathotep of the Necronomicon. There was, too, the baffling problem of the lesser messengers 
or intermediaries, the quasi-animals and queer hybrids which legend depicts as witches' familiars. As Gilman and Elwood retired, too sleepy to argue further, they heard Joe Mazurowicz reel into the house half-drunk and shuddered at the desperate wildness of his whining prayers. That night, Gilman saw the violet light again. In his dream, he had heard a scratching and gnawing in the partitions and thought that someone fumbled clumsily at the latch. Then he saw the old woman and the small furry thing advancing toward him over the carpeted floor. The beldame's face was alight with inhuman exultation, and the little yellow-toothed morbidity tittered mockingly as it pointed at the heavily sleeping form of Elwood on the other couch across the room. A paralysis of fear stifled all attempts to cry out. As once before, the hideous crone seized Gilman by the shoulders, yanking him out of bed and into empty space. Again, the infinitude of the shrieking abysses flashed past him, but in another second he thought he was in a dark, muddy, unknown alley of fetid odors with the rotting walls of ancient houses towering up on every hand. Ahead was the robed black man he had seen in the peaked space in the other dream, while from a lesser distance the old woman was beckoning and grimacing imperiously. Brown Jenkin was rubbing itself with a kind of affectionate playfulness around the ankles of the black man, which the deep mud largely concealed. There was a dark open doorway on the right, which the black man silently pointed. Into this, the grinning crone started, dragging Gilman after her by his pajama sleeves. There were evil-smelling staircases which creaked ominously, and on which the old woman seemed to radiate a faint violet light. And finally, a door leading off a landing. The crone fumbled with the latch and pushed the door open, motioning to Gilman to wait, and disappearing inside the black aperture. The youth's oversensitive ears caught a hideous, strangled cry, and presently the beldame came out of the room bearing a small, senseless form which she thrust at the dreamer as if ordering him to carry it. The sight of this form and the expression on its face broke the spell. Still too dazed to cry out, he plunged recklessly down the noisome staircase and into the mud outside halting only when seized and choked by the waiting black man. As consciousness departed, he heard the faint, shrill tittering of the fanged, rat-like abnormality. On the morning of the 29th, Gilman awakened in a maelstrom of horror. The instant he opened his eyes, he knew something was terribly wrong, for he was back in his old garret room with the slanting wall and ceiling, sprawled on the now unmade bed. His throat was aching inexplicably, and as he struggled to a sitting posture, he saw with growing fright that his feet and pajama bottoms were brown with caked mud. For the moment, his recollections were hopelessly hazy, but he knew at least that he must have been sleepwalking. Elwood had been too deeply in slumber to hear and stop him. On the floor were confused muddy prints, but oddly enough, they did not extend all the way to the door. The more Gilman looked at them, the more peculiar they seemed, for in addition to those he could recognize as his, there were some smaller, almost round markings, such as the legs of a large chair or table might make, except that most of them tended to be divided into halves. There were also some curious muddy rat tracks leading out of a fresh hole and back into it again. Utter bewilderment and the fear of madness racked Gilman as he staggered to the door and saw that there were no muddy prints outside. The more he remembered of his hideous dream, the more terrified he felt, and it added to his desperation to hear Joe Mazurowicz chanting mournfully two floors below. Descending to Elwood's room, he roused his still-sleeping host and began telling of how he had found himself. But Elwood could form no idea of what might have really happened. 
where Gilman could have been, how he got back to his room without making tracks in the hall, and how the muddy furniture-like prints came to be mixed with his in the garret chamber, were wholly beyond conjecture. Then there were those dark, livid marks on his throat, as if he had tried to strangle himself. He put his hands up to them, but found that they did not even approximately fit. While they were talking, Desrochet dropped in to say that he had heard a terrific clattering overhead in the dark, small hours. No, there had been no one on the stairs after midnight, though just before midnight he had heard faint footfalls in the garret, and cautiously descending steps he did not like. It was, he added, a very bad time of year for Arkham. The young gentleman had better be sure to wear the crucifix Joe Mazurowicz had given him. Even the daytime was not safe, for after dawn there had been strange sounds in the house, especially a thin, childish wail hastily choked off. Gilman mechanically attended classes that morning, but was wholly unable to fix his mind on his studies. A mood of hideous apprehension and expectancy had seized him, and he seemed to be waiting the fall of some annihilating blow. At noon, he lunched at the university spa, picking up a paper from the next seat as he waited for dessert. But he never ate that dessert, for an item on the paper's first page left him limp, wild-eyed, and able only to pay his check and stagger back to Elwood's room. There had been a strange kidnapping the night before in Orne's gangway, and the two-year-old child of a clod-like laundry worker named Anastasia Waleko had completely vanished from sight. The mother, it appeared, had feared the event for some time, but the reasons she assigned for her fear were so grotesque that no one took them seriously. She had, she said, seen Brown Jenkin about the place now and then ever since early in March, and knew from its grimaces and titterings that little Ladislas must be marked for sacrifice at the awful Sabbath on Valpurgis night. She had asked her neighbor Mary Zonick to sleep in the room and try to protect the child, but Mary had not dared. She could not tell the police, for they never believed such things. Children had been taken that way every year since she could remember, and her friend, Pete Stowaki, would not help because he wanted the child out of the way. But what threw Gilman into a cold perspiration was the report of a pair of revelers who had been walking past the mouth of the gangway just after midnight. They admitted they had been drunk, but both vowed they had seen a crazily dressed trio furtively entering the dark passageway. There had, they said, been a huge robed negro, a little old woman in rags, and a young white man in his night clothes. The old woman had been dragging the youth, while around the feet of the negro a tame rat was rubbing and weaving in the brown mud. Gilman sat in a daze all the afternoon, and Elwood, who had meanwhile seen the papers and formed terrible conjectures from them, found him thus when he came home. This time neither could doubt but that something hideously serious was closing in around them. Between the phantasms of nightmare and the realities of the objective world, a monstrous and unthinkable relationship was crystallizing and only stupendous vigilance could avert still more direful developments. Gilman must see a specialist sooner or later, but not just now, when all the papers were full of this kidnapping business. Just what had really happened was maddeningly obscure, and for a moment both Gilman and Elwood exchanged whispered theories of the wildest kind. Had Gilman unconsciously succeeded better than he knew in his studies of space and its dimensions? Had he actually slipped outside our sphere to points unguessed and unimaginable? Where, if anywhere, had he been on those nights of demoniac alienage? 
the roaring twilight abysses, the green hillside, the blistering terrace, the poles from the stars, the ultimate black vortex, the black man, the muddy alley and the stairs, the old witch, and the fanged furry horror, the bubble countries, and the little polyhedron, the strange sunburn, the wrist wound, the unexplained image, the muddy feet, the throat marks, the tales and fears of the superstitious foreigners. What did all this mean? To what extent could the laws of sanity apply to such a case? There was no sleep for either of them that night, but next day they both cut classes and drowsed. This was April 30th, and with the dusk would come the hellish Sabbath time, which all the foreigners and the superstitious old folk feared. Mazurowicz came home at six o'clock and said people at the mill were whispering that the Valpurgis revels would be held in the dark ravine beyond Meadow Hill where the old white stone stands in a place clearly devoid of all plant life. Some of them had even told the police and advised them to look there for the missing Waleko child, but they did not believe anything would be done. Joe insisted that the poor young gentleman wear his nickel-chained crucifix, and Gilman put it on and dropped it inside his shirt to humor the fellow. Late at night, the two youths sat drowsing in their chairs, lulled by the praying of the loom fixer on the floor below. Gilman listened as he nodded, his preternaturally sharpened hearing seeming to strain for some subtle, dreaded murmur beyond the noises in the ancient house. Unwholesome recollections of things in the Necronomicon and the Black Book welled up, and he found himself swaying to infendus rhythms said to pertain to the blackest ceremonies of the Sabbat and to have an origin outside the time and space we comprehend. Presently, he realized what he was listening for, the hellish chant of the celebrants in the distant Black Valley. How did he know so much about what they expected? How did he know the time when Nahab and her acolyte were due to bear the brimming bowl which would follow the black cock and the black goat? He saw that Elwood had dropped asleep and tried to call out and waken him. Something, however, closed his throat. He was not his own master. Had he signed the black man's book? After all, then his fevered abnormal hearing caught the distant wind-borne notes. Over miles of hill and field and alley they came, but he recognized them nonetheless. The fires must be lit, and the dancers must be starting in. How could he keep himself from going? What was it that had enmeshed him? Mathematics, folklore, the house, old Keziah, brown Jenkin. And now he saw that there was a fresh rat hole in the wall near his couch. Above the distant chanting and the nearer praying of Joe Mazurwix came another sound. A stealthy, determined scratching in the partitions. He hoped the electric lights would not go out. Then he saw the fanged, bearded little face in the rat hole the accursed little face which he at last realized bore such a shocking, mocking resemblance to old Keziah's, and heard the faint fumbling at the door. The screaming twilight abysses flashed before him, and he felt himself helpless in the formless grasp of the iridescent bubble conjuries. A head raced the small, kaleidoscopic polyhedron, and all through the churning void there was a heightening, an acceleration of the vague tonal pattern which seemed to foreshadow some unutterable and unendurable climax. He seemed to know what was coming, the monstrous burst of Walpurgis rhythm in whose cosmic timber would be concentrated all the primal ultimate space-time seethings which lie behind the massed spheres of matter and sometimes break forth in measured reverberations that penetrate faintly to every layer of the and give 
hideous significance throughout the worlds to certain dreaded periods. But all this vanished in a second. He was again in the cramped, violet-lit and peaked space with the slanting floor, the low cases of ancient books, the bench and table, the queer objects, and the triangular gulf at one side. On the table lay a small white figure, an infant boy, unclothed and unconscious. On the other side stood the monstrous, leering old woman with a gleaming, grotesque hafted knife in her right hand, and a queerly proportioned pale metal bowl covered with curiously chased designs and having delicate lateral handles in her left. She was intoning some croaking ritual in a language which Gilman could not understand, but which seemed like something guardedly quoted in the Necronomicon. As the scene grew clearer, he saw the ancient crone bend forward and extend the empty bowl across the table, and unable to control his own emotions, he reached far forward and took it in both hands noticing as he did so its comparative lightness. At the same moment, the disgusting form of Brown Jenkins scrambled up over the brink of the triangular black gulf on his left. The crone now motioned him to hold the bowl in a certain position while she raised the huge grotesque knife above the small white victim as high as her right hand could reach. The fanged, furry thing began tittering in a continuation of the unknown ritual, while the witch croaked loathsome responses. Gilman felt a gnawing, poignant abhorrence shoot through his mental and emotional paralysis, and the light metal bowl shook in his grasp. A second later, the downward motion of the knife broke the spell completely, and he dropped the bowl with a resounding bell-like clangor while his hands darted out frantically to stop the monstrous deed. In an instant, he had edged up the slanting floor around the end of the table and wrenched the knife from the old woman's claws, sending it clattering over the brink of the narrow triangular gulf. In another instant, however, matters were reversed, for those murderous claws had locked themselves tightly around his own throat while the wrinkled face was twisted with insane fury. He felt the chain of the cheap crucifix grinding into his neck, and in his peril wondered how the sight of the object itself would affect the evil creature. Her strength was altogether superhuman, but as she continued her choking, he reached feebly in his shirt and drew out the metal symbol, snapping the chain and pulling it free. At sight of the device, the witch seemed struck with panic, and her grip relaxed long enough to give Gilman a chance to break it entirely. He pulled the steel-like claws from his neck and would have dragged the Beldame over the edge of the gulf had not the claws received a fresh access of strength and closed in again. This time, he resolved to reply in kind, and his own hands reached out for the creature's throat. Before she saw what he was doing, he had the chain of the crucifix twisted about her neck, and a moment later he had tightened it enough to cut off her breath. During her last struggle, he felt something bite at his ankle and saw that Brown Jenkin had come to her aid. With one savage kick, he sent the morbidity over the edge of the gulf and heard it whimper on some level far below. Whether he had killed the ancient crone, he did not know but he let her rest on the floor where she had fallen. Then, as he turned away, he saw on the table a sight which nearly snapped the last thread of his reason. Brown Jenkin, tough of sinew and with four tiny hands of demoniac dexterity, had been busy while the witch was throttling him, and his efforts had been in vain. What he had prevented the knife from doing to the victim's chest... The yellow fangs of the furry blasphemy had done to a wrist, and the bowl so lately on the floor stood full beside the small, lifeless body. 
In his dream delirium, Gilman heard the hellish alien rhythmed chant of the Sabbat coming from an infinite distance and knew the black man must be there. Confused memories mixed themselves with his mathematics and he believed his subconscious mind held the angles which he needed to guide him back to the normal world alone and unaided for the first time. He felt sure he was in the immemorially sealed loft above his own room. But whether he could ever escape through the slanting floor or the long stooped egress he doubted greatly. Besides, would not an escape from a dream loft bring him merely into a dream house? An abnormal projection of the actual place he sought? He was wholly bewildered as to the relation betwixt dream and reality in all his experiences. The passage through the vague abysses would be frightful, for the Valpurgis rhythm would be vibrating and at last he would have to hear that hitherto veiled cosmic pulsing which he so mortally dreaded. Even now he could detect a low, monstrous shaking, whose tempo he suspected all too well. At Sabbat time it always mounted and reached through to the worlds to summon the initiate to nameless rites. Half the chants of the Sabbat were patterned on his faintly overheard pulsing which no other earthly ear could endure in its unveiled spatial fullness. Gilman wondered too whether he could trust his instincts to take him back to the right part of space. How could he be sure he would not land on that green, litten hillside of a far planet? on the tessellated terrace above the city of tentacled monsters somewhere beyond the galaxy, or in the spiral black vortices of that ultimate void of chaos where reigns the mindless demon Sultan, Azathoth. Just before he made the plunge, the violet light went out and left him in utter blackness. The witch, old Keziah, Nahab, that must have meant her death and mixed with the distant chant of the Sabbat and the whimpers of Brown Jenkin in the gulf below, he thought he heard another and wilder whine from unknown depths. Go, Miserowitz. The prayers against the crawling chaos now turning to an inexplicably triumphant shriek, worlds of sardonic actuality impinging on vortices of febrile dream. Yashub Nigroth. The goat with a thousand young. They found Gilman on the floor of his queerly angled old garret room long before dawn. For the terrible cry had brought Desrochet and Choinsky and Dombrowski and Mizorowicz at once. And had even awakened the soundly sleeping Elwood in his chair. He was alive and with open staring eyes but seemed largely unconscious. On his throat were the marks of murderous hands, and on his left ankle was a distressing rat bite. His clothing was badly rumpled and Joe's crucifix was missing. Elwood trembled, afraid to even speculate what new form his friend's sleepwalking had taken. Mazurowicz seemed half-dazed because of a sign he said he had had in response to his prayers and he crossed himself frantically when the squealing and whimpering of a rat sounded from beyond the slanting partition. When the dreamer was settled on his couch in Elwood's room, they sent for Dr. Malkowski, a local practitioner who would repeat no tales where they might prove embarrassing, and he gave Gilman two hypodermic injections which caused him to relax in something like natural drowsiness. During the day, the patient regained consciousness at times and whispered his newest dream disjointedly to Elwood. It was a painful process, and at its very start brought out a fresh and disconcerting fact. Gilman, whose ears had so lately possessed an abnormal sensitiveness, was now stone deaf. Dr. Malkowski, summoned again in haste, told Elwood that both eardrums were ruptured as if by the impact of some stupendous sound intense beyond all human conception or endurance. How such a sound could have been heard in the last few hours without arousing all the Miskatonic Valley was more than the honest physician could say. 
Elwood wrote his part of the colloquy on paper, so that a fairly easy communication was maintained. Neither knew what to make of the whole chaotic business, and decided it would be better if they thought as little as possible about it. Both, though, agreed that they must leave this ancient and accursed house as soon as it could be arranged. Evening papers spoke of a police raid on some curious revelers in a ravine beyond Meadow Hill just before dawn, and mentioned that the white stone there was an object of age-long superstitious regard. Nobody had been caught, but among the scattering fugitives had been glimpsed a huge negro. In another column it was stated that no trace of the missing child Ladislas Woleko had been found. The crowning horror came that very night. Elwood will never forget it, and was forced to stay out of college the rest of the term because of the resulting nervous breakdown. He had thought he heard rats in the partition all evening, but paid little attention to them. Then, long after both he and Gilman had retired, the atrocious shrieking began. Elwood jumped up, turned on the lights, and rushed over to his guest's couch. The occupant was emitting sounds of veritably inhuman nature, as if racked by some torment beyond description. He was writhing under the bedclothes, as a great stain was beginning to appear on the blankets. Elwood scarcely dared to touch him, but gradually the screaming and writhing subsided. By this time, Dombrowski, Choinsky, Desrochet, Mazurowicz, and the top floor lodger were all crowding into the doorway, and the landlord has sent his wife back to telephone for Dr. Malkowski. Everybody shrieked when a large rat-like form suddenly jumped out from beneath the ensanguined bedclothes and scuttled across the floor to a fresh open hole close by. When the doctor arrived and began to pull down those frightful covers, Walter Gilman was dead. It would be barbarous to do more than suggest what had killed Gilman. There had been virtually a tunnel through his body. Something had eaten his heart out. Dombrowski, frantic at the failure of his rat poisoning efforts, cast aside all thought of his lease and within a week had moved with all of his lodgers to a dingy but less ancient house in Walnut Street. The worst thing for a while was keeping Joe Mazurowicz quiet, for the brooding loom fixer would never stay sober and was constantly whining and muttering about spectral and terrible things. It seems that on that last hideous night, Joe had stopped to look at the crimson rat tracks which led from Gilman's couch to the nearby hole. On the carpet, they were very indistinct, but a piece of open flooring intervened between the carpet's edge and the baseboard. There, Mazurowicz had found something monstrous. Or thought he had, for no one could quite agree with him despite the undeniable queerness of the prints. The tracks on the flooring were certainly vastly unlike the average prints of a rat, but even Choinsky and Desrochet would not admit that they were like the prints of four tiny human hands. The house was never rented again. As soon as Dombrowski left it, the pall of its final desolation began to descend, for people shunned it both on account of its old reputation and because of the new, fetid odor. Perhaps the ex-landlord's rat poison had worked after all, for not long after his departure the place became a neighborhood nuisance. Health officials traced the smell to the closed spaces and beside the eastern garret room, and agreed that the number of dead rats must be enormous. They decided, however, that it was not worth their while to hew open and disinfect the long-sealed spaces, for the fetter would soon be over, and the locality was not one which encouraged fastidious standards. Indeed, there were always vague local tales of unexplained stenches upstairs in the witch house, just after May Eve and Hallowmass. The neighbors acquiesced in the inertia, but the fetter nonetheless formed an additional count against the place. Toward the last, the house was condemned as a habitation by the building inspector. Gilman's dreams and their attendant circumstances have never been explained. Elwood, 
whose thoughts on the entire episode are sometimes almost maddening, came back to college the next autumn and was graduated in the following June. He found the spectral gossip of the town much diminished, and it is indeed a fact that, notwithstanding certain reports of a ghostly tittering in the deserted house, which lasted almost as long as that edifice itself, no fresh appearances either of old Keziah or of Brown Jenkin have been muttered of since Gilman's death. It is rather fortunate that Elwood was not in Arkham in that later year when certain events abruptly renewed the local whispers about elder horrors. Of course, he heard about the matter afterward and suffered untold torments of black and bewildered speculation, but even that was not as bad as actual nearness and several possible sights would have been. In March 1931, a gale wrecked the roof and great chimney of the vacant witch house, so that a chaos of crumbling bricks, blackened moss-grown shingles, and rotting planks and timbers crashed down into the loft and broke through the floor beneath. The whole attic story was choked with debris from above, but no one took the trouble to touch the mess before the inevitable raising of the decrepit structure. That ultimate step came the following December, and it was when Gilman's old room was cleared out by reluctant, apprehensive workmen that the gossip began. Among the rubbish which had crashed through the ancient slanting ceiling were several things which made the workmen pause and call in the police. Later, the police in turn called in the coroner and several professors from the university. There were bones badly crushed and splintered, but clearly recognizable as human, whose manifestly modern date conflicted puzzlingly with the remote period at which their only possible lurking place, the low, slant forward loft overhead, had supposedly been sealed from all human access. The coroner's physician decided that some belonged to a small child, while certain others, found mixed with shreds of rotten brownish cloth, belonged to a rather undersized, bent female of advanced years. Careful sifting of debris also disclosed many tiny bones of rats caught in the collapse, as well as older rat bones gnawed by small fangs in a fashion now and then highly productive of controversy and reflection. Other objects found included the mangled fragments of many books and papers, together with a yellowish dust left from the total disintegration of still older books and papers. All without exception appeared to deal with black magic in its most advanced and horrible forms, and the evidently recent date of certain items is still a mystery as unsolved as that of the modern human bones. An even greater mystery is the absolute homogeneity of the crabbed, archaic writing found on a wide range of papers whose conditions and watermarks suggest age differences of at least 150 to 200 years. To some, though, the greatest mystery of all is the variety of utterly inexplicable objects, objects whose shapes, materials, types of workmanship, and purpose baffle all conjecture, found scattered amidst the wreckage in evidently diverse states of injury. One of these things, which excited several Miskatonic professors profoundly, is a badly damaged monstrosity, plainly resembling the strange image which Gilman gave to the College Museum, save that it is large, wrought of some peculiar bluish stone instead of metal and possessed of a singularly angled pedestal with indecipherable hieroglyphics. Archaeologists and anthropologists are still trying to explain the bizarre designs chased on a crushed bowl of light metal whose inner side bore ominous brownish stains when found. Foreigners and credulous grandmothers are equally garrulous about the modern nickel crucifix with broken chain mixed in the rubbish, and shiveringly identified by Joe Mazurowicz as that which he had given poor Gilman many years before. Some believe this crucifix was dragged up to the sealed loft by rats, 
while others think it must have been on the floor in some corner of Gilman's old room at the time. Still others, including Joe himself, have theories too wild and fantastic for sober credence. When the slanting wall of Gilman's room was torn out, the once sealed triangular space between that partition and the house's north wall was found to contain much less structural debris, even in proportion to its size, than the room itself. Though it had a ghastly layer of older materials which paralyzed the wreckers with horror. In brief, the floor was a veritable ossuary of the bones of small children. Some fairly modern, but others extending back in infinite gradations to a period so remote that crumbling was almost complete. On this deep, bony layer rested a knife of great size, obvious antiquity, and grotesque, ornate, and exotic design, above which the debris was piled. In the midst of this debris, wedged between a fallen plank and a cluster of cemented bricks from the ruined chimney, was an object destined to cause more bafflement, veiled fright, and openly superstitious talk in Arkham than anything else discovered in the haunted and accursed building. This object was the partly crushed skeleton of a huge diseased rat, whose abnormalities of form are still a topic of debate and source of singular reticence among the members of Miskatonic's Department of Comparative Anatomy. Very little concerning this skeleton has leaked out, but the workmen who found it whisper in shocked tones about the long brownish hairs with which it was associated. The bones of the tiny paws, it is rumored, imply prehensile characteristics more typical of a diminutive monkey than of a rat, while the small skull with its savage yellow fangs is of the utmost anomalousness, appearing from certain angles like a miniature, monstrously degraded parody of a human skull. The workmen crossed themselves in fright when they came upon this blasphemy, but later burned candles of gratitude in St. Stanislaus Church because of the shrill, ghostly tittering they felt they would never hear again. I hope you enjoyed the story, and thanks for listening all season. If you haven't already, I hope you'll subscribe through your favorite podcasting platform so that you'll be updated when I return for season two. Don't forget to send me your most terrifying stories, be they fiction or nonfiction, submissions at thedreadfamiliar.com. The Dreams in the Witch House was written by H.P. Lovecraft. The Dread Familiar was created by Joel Hackett. Thanks for listening. Good night. <laughs>